Hey everyone, my name is Jay. Thank you so much for being here. On behalf of the entire church, we are happy to have you. We believe that everyone is welcome. So whether you're here in Bellevue or online, you are part of the BCC family. Speaking of everyone is welcome, hey new guests, we are thrilled that you are with us today. We hope that you're enjoying your experience so far, and if you're new today or maybe this is your third time and you're ready to get connected, fill out a connect card that you'll find in between your seats, or you can text hello to 402-207-5604. This will let us know that you're interested in seeing all that BCC has to offer. For our online guests, head to bellevuechristian.com forward slash connect and fill out an online card. We want to get to know you and welcome you into the family. I want to share with you our Church Center app. This app has amazing tools and helps you stay connected to BCC. You'll easily find things like ways to give, registration for our kids' life groups, church retreats and conferences, outreach projects, and more. We also have a connect button for you. Using the connect button, you can find our prayer request form, opportunities to serve, ways for you to share your testimony, and so much more. Also within our app, we have easy ways to sign up for life groups. Once you click on the life groups icon, you can search all the groups that we have. You can view the days that they meet, locations, and see what type of group that it is. We have men's groups, women's groups, young adult groups, serve groups, and more. If you're thinking an app isn't quite my style, simply go to bellevuechristian.com forward slash life groups. From there, you can read more about life groups and hopefully get some of your questions answered. You can find the link to sign up for a group and even become a life group leader right on this page. We hope that you join a life group today because we believe that everyone is welcome. middle schoolers or high schoolers, we have exciting opportunities for our kids to get involved with BCC. First, our BCC kids meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. downstairs. Kids, if you're new, head on down and ask for Miss Michelle, our next-gen pastor. She's so wonderful and would love to meet you and give you a special friend to hold on tight to. Also for our kids, Wednesday night is their own life group night. Every few months, the life groups change with cool new themes, so be sure to check out bellevuechristian.com forward slash BCC kids to sign up for a kids life group. Don't think I forgot about our youth. On Sundays, our sixth to eighth graders meet with members of our youth team to hear messages that are specific for them. On Wednesday nights, our sixth through 12th graders meet at BCC for worship and a message. We want to walk through life with you and help you navigate this ever-changing culture. I hope to see you at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Are you looking for ways to serve your BCC family? Online, you can find opportunities by visiting bellevuechristian.com forward slash serve. Each serve team is unique in their own way and allows you to best use the gifts and talents that God has given you. Click on the drop down arrow to learn more about each group. When you're ready to take that next step, fill out our serve team form. This is a great step in getting connected. Members of our team will be able to find the best fit for you. We believe that saved people serve people. So sign up today to become a part of our Serve Team family. We can't wait to celebrate Jesus with you. Now let's get ready to worship.
shout of praise this morning. God, you're good. We worship you, Lord. If you're not standing already, come on and stand to your feet. Are you ready to worship Jesus this morning? Sing a little louder. 
you free. If God's presence is in the room, come on and give him praise today. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. Well, we just want to welcome everybody in the room. Are you excited? Are you ready to worship Jesus this morning? God's presence is in this place, and we just want to stop and welcome everybody watching online. We've been praying for you, and we believe that this morning is going to encourage you and help you to take another step closer to Jesus. Are you ready? Come on, church. Are you ready? Are you ready? God is in this room. We believe here at Bellevue Christian Center that God's presence is our first pursuit. And we're going to make all of today about that. In fact, this whole week is going to be about pursuing his presence. And so this morning, if you want to step out of your seat and join us as we worship around the front, you're welcome to come. But church family, come on, can we close our eyes? Can you lift your hands all around the room this morning? We just want to, before we sing another song, we just want to lift our own song to him today. Can we do that? Jesus, you're worthy of all of our praise. And this morning we've set aside time so we can come into your presence. Lord, and we can lift up the name of Jesus high above every other name. God, we glorify you. We exalt you. God, and we just say that you're welcome in this room. You're welcome. Come on, tell them that this morning. God, you can have all my heart. You can have all of my worship. You can have all that I am. God, this morning, we just want to glorify you. We want to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, say amen. Say amen. 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 It's been so good to us.
God, we just thank you for being in the room with us right now. God, we thank you that you are never far from us, Father, that you hear every cry, you hear every word we speak, God, you, you feel every emotion that happens within us, God. We are so thankful that you're here in the room and that you hear us and that your Holy Spirit is here to be our guide and to be our comfort. God, we're so thankful. We're so, so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, we have some very special people today that made the decision to get baptized. And can we give it up for them as they come forward? And so we are so excited for this bold decision that they made to be fully committed and to share that with their church family. We want to take a moment before they head to the baptismal and we want to pray over them. So if you are a family member or a friend or a prayer team, we want to invite you to come forward as we pray over these six individuals that got baptized. So come on up, prayer team, family, friends. We just want to surround them. And lift them up in prayer. If you are at your seats, could you just do me a favor and just extend a hand towards them? So, God, we are just so thankful for the way you are moving in their life, God. For the way that your love is changing and transforming them, God. We are so thankful for this bold and courageous decision to be fully committed to you and to share that with all of their family and with all of their peers, God. We're thankful, God, for what this symbolizes, God, as they go underwater and as they come out and become this new creation that you designed them and created them to be. Father, we pray that this day would be a very special day and unforgettable day for them, that they would hear you speak to them and let them know that you are well pleased with them. And God, that you are going to be with them every single step, every single day of their life, God, that you will never leave them, you will never forsake them, God, that you are always an earshot away. And so God, as they just take this step of faith with you, God, we just pray, God, for just a boldness and an increase, God, in the purpose and how you created them to be. And even right now, God, I just pray that they would just hear from you, hear from your Holy Spirit, that you're with them, that you're proud of them, that they are your sons and your daughters, and you are well pleased in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As they head up to the baptismal, you may be seated. So baptisms are exciting, and we're really excited for them. But church, do we know, do you all understand that there is a part that you play in being a part of this day? There is a part that you play. You see, there's significance in them getting baptized with, in front of their church community because God created this community so that we can be an encouragement, we can be a challenge for them, we can continue to hold them accountable and, and, and just be their cheerleaders in life. And so as we see them get up there and share their story and why they chose to get baptized, I want you to know that God wants you to be a part of their story. That may be directly, that may be indirectly, that may be by you getting coffee with them or you taking them out to lunch or you praying for them. It also may be an indirect way of how you come to church and you help us create this family community but we want you guys to know that not only are you witnesses to this but God is inviting you to be a part of the stories that are taking place this morning can we do that church are we ready for that all right well let's celebrate with them as pastor Jay leads us through baptisms all right. Well, as Pastor Richard said, we're excited for these six individuals who are getting baptized this morning. And first up, I have Leah with me. Can you guys put give your hand put your hands together for Leah? 
Leah, can you share with everybody today why you want to be baptized? I accepted Jesus into my heart. Yeah, that's awesome. On your nose. Okay, Leah, well, because you have accepted Jesus into your heart and you want to live with him for the rest of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, and next up, we've got Amen. Give it up for Amen. Amen, can you go ahead and share with everyone why you want to be baptized this morning? I want to be baptized because I want to rededicate my life to Jesus, and I want to show this church that I can be created into a new person. I love Jesus, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. All right, yes. Yeah. Amen. I love your dedication for Jesus, and uh, because of your commitment to follow him, it's my privilege to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, here we've got Kalia with us. Can you guys put your hands together for Kalia? Julia, can you share with us today why you want to be baptized? Yeah. Okay. I'm getting baptized to start a new beginning in my life and devoting my life to Jesus Christ and just ultimately living the best life through him. Amen. Amen. All right, Kalia, because of your dedication to follow Jesus, it's my privilege today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. here with us. Can you guys put your hands together for Jaslyn? And Jaslyn, can you share with us this morning why you want to be baptized? Um, I just want to dedicate the rest of my life to living for the Lord and with the Lord. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Well, Jaslyn, because of your profession of faith and your desire to follow Jesus, it's my privilege to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next up, we have Tanisha. Can you guys put it up, give it up for Tanisha? Tanisha, can you share with us this morning why it is that you want to be baptized? Because I've known God for my whole entire life. I love God and Jesus, and I want to get the opportunity to know him. And I'm ready to devote my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Shemaine. All right, Tanisha, because of your desire to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, it's my privilege to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've got one more this morning. This is Noah. Can you guys give it up for Noah? All right, Noah, can you tell us this morning why you want to be baptized? Uh, so 2023 was not a great year for me and my family, and uh, God was there to help me pick up the pieces. So, Awesome, awesome. Well, Noah, we're excited for you this morning, and because of your commitment to follow Jesus, rededicate your life to him. It's my privilege to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. church we love celebrating how God is changing lives you may be in here and you're like I haven't been baptized yet well hey don't worry we will have another baptism opportunity very soon just when we, we play those video announcements actually watch them and then you'll get to see oh hey there's the next baptism all right so we will have some baptism announcements very soon and you can have your opportunity to get baptized as well well, first, I want to just say a big welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time today. Can we get up, give it up for our first-time guests? 
We are just so thankful that you wanted to come and be a part of Bellevue Christian Center today. If you want to just get a little bit more connected, take that next step with your church family, we have these connect cards that you can find in between the seats. You can just go ahead and you can just fill that out and uh, you can drop in the giving plate as it passes by. And we just want to get in touch with you and see how as a church we can serve you. We're so thankful, first time guests, for being here with us. We also have a special gift for you at the Info Center. You can take that connect card out there after service, and we'd love to just bless you a little bit with a new gift. Uh, we also want to invite our welcome team forward as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings. So I want to say a big thank you because yesterday we had a group of people come and help us do some much needed cleaning around our church. Can we give it up for those that came to our church cleanup yesterday? Church, I want you to know that we filled up two dumpsters worth of stuff that was in our facility that we needed to get rid of. But not only that, we went through every kid's classroom downstairs and we did a deep clean of all of those classrooms, wiped down every surface, every toy, because we just want to have an incredible space for our kids every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night. And the reason we're so passionate about taking care of our facility is because we believe that God has blessed us with this, this facility so that we can use it to serve our community. Like you may not know this, but this facility is used by our Offutt Air Force Base. It's used by Bellevue Public Schools. It's used by uh, some, some of our uh, Christian uh, schools here in the area. It's used for birthday parties and baby showers and other Christian organizations having conferences here and concerts. We love this facility because God has given us this facility to be a blessing to our community. And one of the ways that I'm excited for us to continue to bless our community is through our Military Parents Night Out because we have another one coming up on April 27th. And we love it because we just found out that military couples are having a tough time finding time for them to just get together as a couple because they can't find childcare. So we started offering free childcare on specific nights for our military community, and it has been such a blessing to them. It's been such a blessing. The response has been so crazy that usually with one, within one or two days, all of our signups are completely full. Like we opened up this, this uh, one for April 27th and our signups filled up in the first day. In the first day. And we would love to open up the signups to receive more kids, but we need a few more volunteers. And so if you would like to bless our military community and be a part of our Military Parents Night Out, you can fill out a Connect card or you can come and visit with me after service and we'd love to get you plugged in as well. But that's why we give our tithes and our offerings because our tithes and our offerings, they help us provide this facility as a way of serving our community. So thank you, church, for being for Bellevue and continuing to be faithful to to God with your, with your finances. Can we pray over our finances? God, we just thank you so much for every dollar. We thank you, God, for every opportunity that we can give to be a part of what you're doing. And so, Father, as we continue to, to tithe and as we continue to give in those offerings, God, and give to our global missions, God, we just thank you that we know that you will always provide everything that we need, God, that you'll provide it for us as a family, you'll provide it for us as a church community, God. And so, God, we pray that you would bless these funds, that you would grow them, and that you would use them to impact lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church, for giving. At this point, we would like to uh, uh, invite our, uh, our middle schoolers to go back to our middle school service. Behind these two doors, middle schoolers, you guys can go have some fun. But we also have many things going on over the next couple of months. So why don't you turn your attention to the screens and find out what's happening at BCC. everyone, I'm Peggy, and welcome to Bellevue Christian Center. First, we want to welcome our first-time guests. We hope you are enjoying your experience so far. If you're new today or have been attending for a few weeks and would like to get more connected, text HELLO to 402-207-5604. We want to get to know you and welcome you into the family. 
in between your seats, there are connect cards and prayer cards. If you didn't get a chance to place these in the giving plates, drop them off in the giving station or bring them to the prayer room. BCC Kids Moms, next Sunday, we want to invite you to Muffins with Mom. If you have a child, a part of BCC Kids, then head downstairs at 9.30 a.m. to grab a muffin and spend time with your children. This is such a fun opportunity to connect with your child, get some yummy treats, and say hi to the other moms. We hope to see all of our BCC kids and their moms at Muffins with Mom next Sunday, April 21st. On Sunday, April 28th, we are holding our annual members meeting. This year, our meeting will take place in the auditorium. We will be serving pizza starting at 5.30 p.m., so plan to come and enjoy some dinner with your church family. The meeting will be officially called to order at 6 o'clock p.m. During the meeting, we will spend some time celebrating all God has done over this past year. We'll also have the opportunity to vote on new board members. Finally, we are going to spend some time praying for our church and for our city. We believe that God has some great things in store for BCC in the years to come. And we want to lay a foundation of prayer and allow God to stir our hearts and give us fresh vision. If you're new to BCC, we want to make sure you know about an incredible resource we use and talk about here frequently. And that's our Church Center app, powered by Planning Center. Church Center allows you to keep everyone up to date on events, available life groups, online giving, and more. To get started, download Church Center on your mobile device. Search for Bellevue Christian Center within the app and create your profile. We hope this helps you and your family stay better connected to what's going on at BCC. Again, I'm Peggy, and there are three ways you can find out what is happening around BCC. Check out our website, follow us at bellevuechristian.ne, or stay up to date on our church-centered app. We believe the Bible changes how we live, so let's explore what God has for us today. Amen. There's a statement that we say every Sunday during our announcements, and it's that the Bible changes how we live. Let's say that together. The Bible changes how we live. And this morning, as we continue our series in the book of John, uh, we have an exciting opportunity again to allow the Word of God, to allow truths that's spoken from God's very heart to us to change how we live. I believe this morning, if you will open your heart and say, God, I want to I wanna, I wanna be more like you today than ever before. God, today, speak to my heart. Change me that I might live for you. I believe that each and every one of us today, listen to this, we'll move closer to what God intends for our heart. How many say that's what I want this morning? Father, as we lift our hands to you this morning, we declare that we want to be more like you. God, we want your word to change us. We, we want your word to, to convict us and convince us of the truth of how you created us to be. God, no longer do we want to live according to what we think and what we feel and what others say, but God, we want to be men and women, boys and girls, created by the hand of a loving God. In Jesus' name we pray, and if you agree, say amen. amen. Well, we're in John chapter 1, and last week we started out with the prologue, the first 18 verses, and incredible passage. I, I believe that's one of the most important passages in the, the Word of God. For within those 18 verses, we learn 
exactly who Jesus Christ is. The fact that, that Jesus was here before anything was created. He, he wasn't just born. Jesus always existed. We, we learned that, that he's a part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is part of the Godhead. He, he's deity. And we went on to learn all kinds of things about how we need to view Jesus in light of who he is. I believe that in any Christian university across America, that they could take those first 18 verses and do a whole semester just on those 18 verses because they are so critical in our understanding and appreciation of who Jesus is. And we also learned who a herald was, someone that, that goes forward and, and, and proclaims Jesus and prepares people for Jesus' heart. Now, we were introduced to a, a lightweight herald last week, uh, Andy Cow. He's he's, he, he was the herald that helped us understand who Jesus is, and he, and he, he he's pretty good. But this morning, we're going to learn from the first herald by the name of John the Baptist. For some of you uh, young people, uh, the word herald might be hard for you to grasp, so I would say he was Jesus' hype man. He, he was a man that before you got to know or see Jesus, you got to know or see John the Baptist. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at this, this, how does the Bible describe this man? This, this man who wore camel hair right out of GQ magazine. I mean, he was, he was, people saw him and, and their eyes just locked upon his wardrobe. And, 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 and the scripture said that not only was he handsome in his, in his clothing, but he ate honey. How many of you love honey? But have you ever had honey on a bug? Man, John the Baptist was incredible. Then his beard and his hair, and he was just kind of a strange dude. But he was the man that God chose to announce to us who Jesus Christ is. He was the man who had the words for us. So this morning, we're going to begin in verse 19 of chapter 1. And as you study the book of John, right here, it's beginning at verse 19, we get to see the first week of Jesus' life, his first ministry. And it starts in verse 19, and today we're going to go 19 through 34, and we're going to look at the first two days, the first two days of Jesus' ministry on earth. Start at verse 19. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well, then, who are you, they ask? Are you Elijah? Nope. Are you the prophet we're expecting? Nope. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. Those who sent them were the Pharisees. They had heard about uh, the, the, this man uh, at the Jordan River baptizing, and they wanted to know who he was. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? Now, a little background. This was not the first experience that the Jews had with baptism. Matter of fact, baptism was a part of their culture. But in their culture, you baptize Gentiles who were coming to Jewish faith. So baptism was a ceremonial display of cleansing from the Gentile lifestyle to the Jewish lifestyle. So in their minds, it was a ceremony that was performed by higher authority upon Gentiles, not upon Jews. So here was this man baptizing Jews, and that brought attention to the Pharisees. Verse 24. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you don't recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. 
See, John realized through his relationship with Jesus who Jesus was. How many of you remember the Christmas story? You remember Zechariah the priest and when he was, he was in the temple and he was praying and, and Gabriel, the angel, came to him and told him that he was going to have a son and the name is son John and he talks to Elizabeth and told her the same thing. This is that John. This is that very John that we celebrate in the Christmas story. Not only is this that same John, but when it, that same angel went to see Mary, he told her that she was going to have a son and his name would be Jesus. And they were cousins. So you see the relationship here? And, and the thing I love about the Christmas story, you remember when Mary went to visit Elizabeth and she came into the home and she said, Elizabeth! And the baby, John, in her womb leaped for joy because he knew he was in the presence of the Savior. He was in the very presence of the one that God had anointed and charged and commissioned him to preach about. And the scripture says, at the very voice of Mary, John leaped in a room and, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's what's happening here. This is why John is so passionate about this man, about this Savior that he's announcing to the world. He's not just a man, he's Jesus. And he's the one that we learned about last week. Verse 28, the encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of Jordan River, where John was baptizing, day one. Now we go to day two. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater, far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Born at the same time, but he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32, then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water. Jesus was baptizing with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testified that he is the chosen one of God. See, John knew. John had a revelation of who Jesus Christ was, and that's why he baptized. Now, I want you to pay attention of, of, of a parallel scripture in Matthew. We know what John was commissioned to do. We knew he, he was called to be at the Jordan and, and to baptize people for the remission of their sins, that, that they might be able to follow Jesus. But I want you to pay attention to what his message was. Looking at Matthew chapter 3, in those days, verse 1, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is where things changed. Baptism prior to this was, was a, a ceremony, a, a, a ritual that we went through to bring Gentiles into the kingdom. The baptism that we celebrated this morning was a baptism uh, that people had already been saved. All these candidates here, they were not getting saved this morning. They were not repenting of their sins this morning. They were declaring to you that I'm a Christian, that I have died to my sins, that today I'm risen in new life. That's the baptism that we celebrate today. That's after Jesus. That's, that's after his ministry. That's what baptism means to us. But on this day, on this day, John the Baptist was announcing something to the Gentiles that they had never heard of. Because up to this point, cleansing of them, cleansing of the Jews came about through following the law. And here is John the Baptist saying, repent. Repent of your sins. For, and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. They were moving. This, this, this is a beautiful time in history. 
the kingdom of this world, and Jesus was announcing the kingdom of heaven. And in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to repent. You have to acknowledge your sin. You have to confess your sin before you can even meet Jesus. So John the Baptist's job was to say, hey, guys, we need to get ready. We, we, we need to start taking off some dirty clothes because we're getting ready to meet the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We need to begin preparing our minds and our hearts to meet Jesus because the kingdom of heaven, this new kingdom, this new way of living, this new way of thinking is near. And it came about with Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and turn to God. Repent and turn. Repent and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 3, 6, look at what he says. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. See, baptism, baptism by John demonstrated a recognition of your sins. You, Jesus only baptized you once you confessed and acknowledged your sins. It was a, a recognition that, that I have something in my life that needs to change in order to follow Jesus. It was a, a desire that I would be spiritually cleansed. Now, this was, this was John's statement, but I want you to listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins. Who began to preach? Who began to preach? It wasn't just John's message. It became Jesus' message that they needed to repent of sins and turn to God. For what? The kingdom is near. Folks, as we walk in the kingdom, as we live as kingdom men and women of God, we need to understand that our sins need to be repented of. It's not just something we did one time, but it's something that we continually do to ensure that we're in right relationship with Jesus. So what is, what is repentance? Repentance for many of us is a word that we have no idea what it means. I, I mean, it's, it's like atonement. It's like propitiation. It's like substitutionary atonement. I mean, what are we talking about? So God sent me here this morning to educate us and those of you online what he means by repent of your sins for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance is to change your mind. It's, it's a change of mind. It's a change of attitude. And following that change of mind is a change of actions. It's, it's, it's to think afterwards. It's, it's, it's second thoughts. It's, it's realizing that what I'm thinking, there's something not, not, not quite right. It, this is the picture. We are going this way, and we begin to think. And we kind of slow down, and we say, no, uh-uh. I don't, I don't think this is right. And we turn and go the other way. Now, the picture is we are going towards sin. We are living a sinful life, and we stop, we begin to think, we understand that this is not what I want. Now I want to turn and go to Christ. It, it's, a, it's a direct turn from living sinfully to living for Christ. 1982, April the 18th, Sunday night, about 9 o'clock. Prior to that time, I was going this way. I thought women were provided for my entertainment, and I entertained myself. From high school through college, oh, I loved women. I didn't know any happily married couples. My mom and dad, I never heard them say I love you. I heard them call each other's MFs and SOBs and all of that. That's what I lived in. I went to church with men that I partied with on Saturday and Friday night. That there was no such thing as a, a man who loved one woman. That's what I knew. That was the direction I was going, and I was enjoying myself. And I met Melba. And Melba did something to me. She caused me to stop and, well, man, all these women and stuff, maybe, maybe this is not what I should be doing. But I kept doing it. And then I got in trouble Right before I married her, I had a baby with another woman, and that baby is my oldest daughter, Sarita. 
And I promised Melba it would never happen again. Thinking, I need to change my path, but I didn't change. <laughs> I thought it. I knew it, but I didn't change. I kept going this way. Two years later, officer in the military still chasing sin, had an affair with her best friend, whose husband was my best friend, who was an officer in the military, and in the military, adultery, you go to jail. You go to Leavenworth. I began to think again. <laughs> Man, maybe I ought not to be doing this. And the woman I was in the affair with told her husband, and he came to me, and I said, man, whatever she said is what I did. And I was broken. Not so much because of what I had done, but because I was going to have to tell my wife that I had failed again. I was broken because I knew in my heart that this was right, but I didn't have the wherewithal to change. So as was our custom, we went to church that Sunday night, and I said, God, she's going to find out. Someone's going to tell her. And she's going to leave me. And I said, Lord, tonight, if you will cause Melba to forgive me, I will serve you for the rest of my life. I will give up women. I will give up the desire. I will give it all up and chase you. So that night, the, the uh, pastor gave the altar call. It didn't even matter what the message was. It could have been an episode of Raymond. <laughs> I was getting saved that night. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Everybody shouted because they knew what kind of man I was. Right there that night, I took Melba to the back of the church. And I said, baby, I failed you again. I've been in an affair. The husband knows they're our best friends. And I'm broken. She cried, I cried, we cried, they cried, everybody cried. April the 18th, 1982. I have not been with another woman since that day. <laughs> now, believe me, trust me, I've seen some stuff I shouldn't have seen. I've felt some things in my heart that, that breaks the heart of God. But God has kept me. He's kept me. In, in the fact that I repented of my sin and turned to him, changed my mind about what I was doing, God's kept me. And every day he draws me closer and closer to him. That's repentance. I was going this way and I realized, God, I don't want, and I turned. Folks, repentance is for us. It's a gift from God. It, it's, it's not to, to bust you out. It's not to make you look bad. God knows already. But in his grace and in his mercy, he's provided the opportunity. How about, check this out. How many of you went to college and you had an idea of what you wanted to study when you got to college? And then within six months of the first class, you said, no, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> you changed your mind. You changed your mind. And you said, this is not for me. And you studied something. You know what? Uh, it's proven that... The average college student will change majors three times before he graduates. <laughs> they change their mind and say, this is not for me. 50% of math majors change their mind <laughs> within the first three years. Say, uh-uh, I can't do this math thing. Melville teachers about every, 37% uh, of teachers change their mind. And I totally understand why teachers change their mind. That's a job. But the whole idea of changing our minds we stop. We have second thoughts. And folks, God is telling us, you need to stop and think about what you're doing. You need to stop and evaluate. Is this what God has for you? If you're here today and, and you don't know Jesus, you, never, you need to stop and say, God, forgive me. I changed my mind about the way I'm living. I changed my mind about my appetites and my desires. And today I turn and I walk towards you. Today I turn and I give my heart to you. Repentance, it's a change of mind, it's a, it's a change of heart. But the beauty of repentance is, it's not just a change in a direction, it, re, it, it produces fruit in that when we follow God, there's a lifestyle change. 
People see a difference. When you repent, people see a difference in how you leave. See, it's a change in your behavior. It's a change in your living habits. It's a change in your conduct. It's a change in how you hear and you respond to God. It's a change in how we respond and how we love each other. It's a change of our actions. It's a very change of our mind and how we live. There is no repentance if you don't change how you're living. It's just a, it's just a mental exercise. So what do you need to know about repentance? When we sin, we turn from God. But when we repent, we turn to God. We can turn back to God by recognizing our wrong, by recognizing that things aren't right, by, by saying, God, I know this is not your best for me. You remember the prodigal son? Took everything God, his daddy gave him. He went out, riders living, chasing women, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Scripture says he came to his senses. He was eating with the pigs, came to his senses and said, no, watch this, watch this. I'm going to go back to my daddy, but I'm not going to be his son. I'm going to live with the slaves because I'm not worthy to be called his son. Repentance. There, there was a change in his actions. And folks, when you come to Christ and repent, there is a beautiful change in our lives and we come to our senses. Number two, no matter what, repentance is always positive. It is not punishment for your behavior. It's an opportunity to try again. It's always positive. And the devil tells you, no, don't do that. What are people going to think about you? God is saying, I already know about you. It's not what people think. It's what I know. I don't want this for you. Repent. Repent. It's always positive. I don't care what you think. I don't care what, what you think you're going to lose. I don't care what you think people are going to say about you. Every time you repent, it's positive. Repentance is for little sins as much as for big ones. See, we think the only time we need to repent is after we kill somebody. <laughs> Man, you really need to repent. We think the only time we need to repent is when we get caught. How about those little attitudes that you got? Folks, I'm telling you, as, as I've d done this study on repentance, we need to be repenting every day. It, it should be a part of our everyday lifestyle. God, today, I know for me that every day, in thought, word, or deed, I violate something God has for me. I miss the mark. And see, we think uh, the only thing we need to repent of is the things that we've done wrong. How about the things that you didn't do right? How about when God tells you to give and you don't give? How about when God tells you to show mercy and justice and you choose to be judgmental and critical? Folks, all day, every day, there's, there's things we do and we don't do, they omit and things we do that violate God's best for us. And, and we need to have an attitude of repentance and say, God, I know this is not what you have for me. I'm broken. I'm broken. I'm broken by my conduct. I'm broken by my attitudes, my jealousy, my envy. God, I'm broken by the way I compare myself to other people. That's all sin. And just like the big sins, our definition, the big sins, God said, you need to repent of all of that if you want to walk in the kingdom of heaven. Repentance always leads to action. When you look at the scriptures and you look at repentance, you hear things like repent and be baptized. Repent and be saved. Repent and sin no more. Repent and turn to God. You just don't repent in your head and look the same. There's a change. There's an action. There's something different about you. When you look at Matthew 3, 8, in that same chapter that we've been looking at where Jesus was talking about uh, repentance, he said something like this. He was talking to the, to the Pharisees, and he says, uh, uh, repentance that's worthy 
of fruit. Fruit that's worthy of repentance. Fruit that's worthy of repentance. If there's no fruit, if there's no fruit, there's no repentance. You're doing the same thing you were doing before. So that's what uh, repentance is. Why do we need repentance? It's very easy. 1 John 1, 8 through 10, listen to what it says. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. If you claim you have no sin, if you claim, I love that word claim, if you deceive yourself, if you, if you really think you have no sin, and sometimes we Christians talk to unsaved people like we have no sin. <laughs> and I love this passage. You're fooling yourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us and to cleanse us. If we claim we have not sinned, this is even a bigger one. You're calling God a liar. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. No, no, no. If you say you haven't sinned, you're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. There's this story, this painter, and uh, this painter was uh, painting this beautiful home, and, and uh, he bid on the house and, and won the, the bid, and, and he was painting, and, 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 and about halfway in, he realized he didn't have enough paint. So he began to thin the paint out, and, and he was just painting and going. And then about two-thirds in, he realized he was really in trouble when it came to the paint. So he thinned it out even more. And then when he finished the house, oh, he was so proud. And he just stood back and, and looked at the great work he had done. And as he did that, he heard a crackle of thunder. And then rain started pouring. And rain beat upon this beautiful home that he had painted. And next thing you knew is he stood there. All that paint that had thinned out was just at his feet, and the home was in terrible condition. And he fell upon his knees, and he cried out, God, what am I going to do? God, tell me what to do now. And as he cried out to God, broken, re he listened, and he heard this word from heaven, repent, repaint, <laughs> and thin no more. See, when we, when we sin, when we, when we miss, when we mess up, that's what God's going to tell you. Repent. Repent. Just repent. Just repent. And, and one of the things I love about when we choose to repent, not in all cases, but in most cases, God changes the circumstances of our sin, the consequences of our sin. Now, I'm not saying he always removes them, but sometimes he even removes the consequences of your sin. He reduces the consequences of your sin. He modifies the consequences because you've been broken by what you've done. That's what Father does. Folks, we need to be comfortable with repenting. It, it, should, be, it should be a joyful part of our lives to repent because of our sin. See, repentance allows God to forgive and cleanse. Repentance allows God to, some of us, we want to just continue to live the way we're living and expect God to forgive us, and we haven't repented. We haven't said, God, I need to change. And the scripture says that when we repent, he forgives, and what's he do? He cleanses us. Some of us, we're walking around dirty because we refuse to repent. What else does it do? Repentance keeps us humble. See, when you're broken by your sin, it keeps you from looking at other people's sin, and it keeps you in a bowed position with God. How many of you remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector who were praying? And the Pharisee said, oh, God, I thank you that I am not a sinner, that I'm not an adulterer, that I'm not like this tax collector. God, I thank you that I tithe. God, I thank you that, that, that I give everything you've given me. I give it away. 
oh God, thank you for who I am. <laughs> Tax collector could not lift his eyes to heaven. He bowed himself and he beat his chest. God, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. Scripture says, which one of those did God honor more? The one who was steeped in pride? The one who was humbled by his sin? Who was broken by his sin? See, repentance keeps us humble. Number three, repentance frees us from the torment of sin. Repentance keeps us from the torment. When, when I wasn't willing to confess my sins to God and others due to pride and shame, I found myself continuing to sin and, and just continually being tormented. Now, now this, this, <sighs> cowboys, forgive me. Can't we look at Papa and say, I forgive you, Papa. If Matthew was here, I'd ask Matthew to forgive me too. But I have one son and, and, and four grandsons. And all four, all five of these men have had the same problem at, what, junior high and a little before that. There's this thing about taking baths. <laughs> There's this thing about taking a bath. And you taught them how to take a bath, and, and you know they know how to take a bath, but they choose... Not to take a bath. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Any parents in here know what I'm talking about? You got boys who, they know how to take a bath. And then you ask them, did you take a bath? Yeah. <laughs> well, what is that smell? <laughs> why? Why? Yeah, if you took a And they know they're lying. You know they're lying, but they say, yeah, I took a bath. Yeah. And then they, and what cracks me up is when they get, they get mad at you for challenging them on the smell. So after a while as parents, we get tired of telling them to go take a shower, go take a bath. So what do we say? We just give up. And when they come around, we just say, you stink. And we don't, that's it. We, we, we don't tell them what to do. We just let them know that you stink. Some of you, God is telling you today you need to take a shower. Some of you have been told you stink. And you just continue on, not taking a shower, not repenting, and you're being tormented. You are being tormented, and the people around you are being tormented by that smell. This morning, God is saying, repent. It's an invitation to respond to the sin in our lives and say, God, I understand, and I'm being tormented, but today I choose to come to you. Acts 3, 19, listen to what it says. Now repent of your sins and turn to God. See the, the action? And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away, then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. When you repent and you're tired of living the way you're living and you're tired of the smell and you're tired of the torment, the Scripture says, Jesus said, when you repent, he will give you refreshing. He will give you refreshing. He will give you refreshment, and you won't be living with the smell. You won't be living with people looking at you and saying, why are you continuing to live that way? You don't have to. Repent. Repent. That time's of refreshing. Folks, when you repent, time's of refreshing. And you're worried about the consequences. And you're missing the biggest consequence of being in his presence with no guilt, with no shame. Why should we repent? Because we all sin. We're all tormented. We have a smell. And God is saying, I want to relieve you of that. In closing, I want to identify five 
steps to repentance. Now listen, as I identify these, there are not steps to check off. Okay, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. now I repent. No, because oftentimes repentance looks different in my life from day to day. Repentance looks different in my life than it's going to look in your life. It, it looks different. But these five concepts you need to be aware of when you repent. You, you need to understand what's happening in your life when you repent. And, and I just want to identify these five things quickly. Number one, well, all five of them. First is recognition of sin. Second is remorse, remorse of sin. We need to resolve over sin. We need to have a reformation in our hearts from the sin, and then we need to have restitution of the sin. Some more religious words that I hope to explain to you today. Number one, recognition of the sin. John 8, 31 and 32 says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will what? Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, when it comes to sin, when it comes to repentance, you need to know the truth about sin. Some of you, you you're walking around sinning and you think you're okay, but you need to know that sin will kill you. Then you need to know the costliness. What that sin, today, today it might look like you're getting over like a fat cat. But in the long run, that sin is going to cost you. You need to know the costliness of sin. You need to know the consequences of your sin. You need to know the death that comes with sin. You need to know how to deal with sin. All that comes with knowing the truth. But the first step, you need to understand you need to recognize sin in your life. That's the big sins, as well as those little attitudes. Those little foxes that spoil the vine in your life. Those little things that you've accepted and said, well, that's the way I've always been. No. Those little things that you say, well, God knows. Pastor Campbell was very on staff, and whenever we talk about confessing sin, he says it's, it's, it's good for the soul, but it's bad for the image. <laughs> because you want people to think different of you. You don't want people to know that you are a sinner just like they are. You need to know, recognize sin. Number two, you need to have remorse. You need to have remorse for your sin. You need to have godly sorrow. Second Corinthians 7. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God, the sorrow that's according to the will of God, the sorrow that's according to the will of God produces repentance. When you're broken, when you're, when you're the tax collector and you're broken by your sin, it causes you to repent. And I think for many of us, that's what we're missing. We're not broken. We're not broken by how we're living. You need to have remorse. It causes repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. We need to be broken. Number three, we need to have resolve over sin. Resolve means that you need to be determined that I got to change, that, that I know what sin is, I'm broken by the sin, and I know I cannot live like this any longer. I have made a resolve that I am stopping this and I'm going to Christ. I beseech you, brothers, Romans 12, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is the perfect will of God, your rational service to him. And be not conformed, listen, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. The resolve comes when you've renewed your mind and said, God, I understand this is not for me. God, I understand that you don't want this for me. God, I understand that this will destroy me. God, I understand that if I continue this way, I don't know where I'm going to end up. God, I'm turning. I've made resolve. 
that this attitude, this attitude I have that no one knows about, this, this, this judgmental, critical attitude I have that I've been putting up with and accepting, I'm resolving today that I'm not going to live like this. You recognize the sin, you have remorse, and then you resolve that you're not going to live that way. Number four, then you reform. This is where the actions come in. It's a change of lifestyle. It's a, a, it's a reformation of my actions and my behavior. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the life, the life, the life which I now live in this flesh, the way I live in this flesh, God, I want to live for you. God, I'm no longer going to live the way I want to live, but I'm going to live by faith in the one who loved me. I want to live for faith. I want to live by faith. I want to live my life in the flesh for him and not for you, devil. Devil, I'm going to live for him. I'm not going to tolerate your lies and your deception. I am reforming today. By the power of God, I want to live differently. This life, while I live, I live by faith. I live by faith. God, you, you, you're the one that can do it. I can't do it. So I understand what sin is. I, I'm broken. I have remorse over my sin. I resolve in my head that this is not the way you want me to live. I reform and say, I'm going to live this way. And number five, and finally, I make restitution. <laughs> Sometimes, because of my sin, I need to go make things right. I need to go talk to somebody. <laughs> I need to tell them I was wrong. I was in sin. Will you forgive me? I need, to, I need to give them back what I took from them, what I stole from them. You just can't change and go on like nothing happened. And then sometimes there's nothing you can do. It's between you and God. Sometimes it's just you just need to pray. But you need to understand, you need to ask yourself when you're repenting, do I need to go to someone? Is there something that I need to do? I, I love Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus when Jesus came to see him and he had dinner at his house, another tax collector? And, and as he repented, as Zacchaeus repented, he said, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I have back to you. I'm going to give half back. And then if I have uh, taken advantage of anybody, I'm going to return to them four times what I took. He made restitution. Sometimes, folks, we got to make restitution. God, God takes care of all that. In closing this morning, I'm going to have Melba come and, and read something for us. It's the most beautiful passage in the Word of God, demonstrating repentance. And as she reads it, it's Psalm 51, and as she reads it, I want you, it's not going to be on the screen, I just want you to listen. I want you to listen how David, listen, for those of you who don't know David's story, David killed adultery, covetousness, deceit, lying, Man, this dude did it all, big and little. Two years, he was tormented because he didn't repent. God sent a man that challenged him on what he had done. And Psalm 51 is his response. I want you to listen how David recognizes his sin. I want you to listen to the remorse I want you to listen to the resolve to change. I want you to listen to the, to the reformation to be different. Melba, read Psalm 51 for us. Have mercy on me, on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin 
for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever, always before me. Against you and against you alone have I sinned and I have done evil in the sight of the Lord so that you might be justified in your words. You might be justified and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was even formed in my mother's womb in iniquity, even in conception there was sin. Behold, you delight in truth, truth that's in the inner being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me, purge me, purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, Lord, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy. Let me hear gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Don't cast me away from your presence, God, and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, then, then I will teach transgressors their ways, your ways, and sinners to return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O oh God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it gladly. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. This is the sacrifice that God wants. He wants a broken and contrite spirit. He wants a broken and contrite spirit. You will not despise. You welcome, you encourage, you invite a broken and contrite spirit. Father, today, I want everyone to stand to your feet. Today we come, God, as your children, and we invite you to cleanse us. We invite you to do what only you can do. God, we take opportunity now to repent, to acknowledge our sin before you and before you alone. Father, we thank you for the conviction. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us even now areas in, in our heart where we need to turn away from God as we recognize the sin in our life. God, we thank you for the brokenness. We thank you for the remorse. Now, God, give us the resolve to change and the desire to live out of the fruit of repentance. We're going to have the worship team continue to play. The altars are open. If you're here today, I'm going to invite you to respond even now. Just begin coming. Just begin coming to the altar and saying, God, that's me. I know areas of my heart that are not right with you. If you feel more comfortable at your seats, then you can do it there. But the altars are open as the worship team sings. Let's make things right with the Lord today. Thank you. 
Church, what a powerful message, and, and what we're about to do in this next moment wasn't planned. It wasn't something that was a part of Hook's notes or message, but just something that I sense the Holy Spirit giving us as a church an opportunity to do. As we talk about repentance, one of the things that we can understand as Bellevue Christian Center is that repentance is both for individuals as well as for the church as a whole. And there's an opportunity before us this morning as a church to repent, to acknowledge that God, as your people, as this corporate body, there have been areas in which we've done things wrong, as well as areas in which we've missed the opportunity to do right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just invite, if you are a pastor on staff, I want to ask that you would come to the front. If you are one of our board members, our deacons, I'm going to ask that you would come to the front. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pray a simple prayer of repentance on behalf of Bellevue Christian Center because it's our desire to be a body that is pleasing to the Lord. A body whose pursuit is the presence of God. And we understand that even this corporate body gets it wrong sometimes. So, Father, we come before you. As Bellevue Christian Center, as this church, and we repent. Father, we choose to acknowledge the sin that this church has committed at times. We acknowledge both the actions that we've taken that were wrong, as well as the areas in which we've turned away or we failed to do right. We acknowledge before you, God, that we need you to cleanse this body, to create in us, Bellevue Christian Center, a new clean heart. We ask that your Holy Spirit would not be taken from us, but that you would renew at this church a steadfast spirit. God, that our eyes, our gaze would be fixed on you. God, I just feel inclined to repent for the times that we've elevated mission over you. That we've elevated this desire to do something for you and we've missed the opportunity to be with you. We repent. We change direction. We choose to turn around. We're broken over our sin this morning. Change us. Make us new, cleanse us. We trust you, Lord. We trust you. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. Church, can we just give it up for Jesus? I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Richard. Man, what a powerful Sunday to point to something that should be involved in our daily lives. Amen? Even now, God's, God's challenged me, like, where, where do I need to have some restitution? And, and even reminding me of, like, maybe there's some apologies that I need to have even in my own home with my kids and how I've responded in situations. Man, what a powerful Sunday. We hope that we're able to take this with us as we go and allow it to be a part of that transformation process that Jesus is leading us through. We want to make sure everyone knows that the prayer room is available if you would like prayer for anything going on in your life. We're so thankful that you guys decided to spend today with us. Please enjoy the rest of this beautiful Sunday morning. Have a great day. Thank you. 